I would like to thank everybody and welcome everybody for joining us today for the kickoff of our um, first of four webinar series for the um, application of robotics for the for the trauma and acute care surgeon. We're really excited. The Minimally Invasive Surgery and Emerging Technologies Committee has put this together. I'm really excited to kick it off. Um, there's a great lineup of webinars. I'm going to be doing this first one here discussing robotic surgery for the acute care surgeon. Um, but I encourage everybody to look at the lineup. And if you're interested in the others, for those of you joining today, please go to the East website. Um, and um, we will you know, be happy to, happy to have you register for that. Um, each of these is going to be set up where there will be one speaker and two moderators. And so I will um, have the moderators introduce themselves right now before I kick it off. Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Ruby Skinner. I'm a senior member of EAST, and um, currently I'm a chief medical officer at a dignity facility um, in San Bernardino, California. So it's great to be here. Good morning, everybody from Australia. Uh, Bhavik Patel, I know it's good evening for you. So I just thought I'll shift the things of focus a little bit as Dr. Pakula's talk will take all the limelight. I thought I'll make it into a day for me rather than an evening. Anyways, my name is Bhavik Patel. I'm a trauma, acute care, and a minimally invasive surgeon from the Glitter Strip in Australia. That is the Gold Coast University Hospital. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and I hope you enjoy the session. Great. Thank you both. So um, with that, for everybody on the um, call today, I think we're going to try to keep questions to the end of the talk. If there's anything pressing in the middle um, or, you know, go ahead and and click on the Q&A. Um, all questions will be filtered through the Q&A and then we'll be able to answer them that way. Um, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Andrea Pakula. I am a trauma critical care surgeon and acute care surgeon um, in Southern California at Adventist Health Simi Valley. And as I will explain, I think through my talk, um, I, my practice has transitioned quite a bit. And though I still do trauma and, acute, uh, and, and critical care, my main focus now really is acute care surgery and elective general surgery utilizing the, um, the uh, robotics surgery platform. So, um, you know, a little bit about me. I'm born and raised in Southern California and I did my general surgery residency at Kern Medical Center, which was a very busy level two trauma center in Central California. Um, we saw about 3,400 uh, 3,400 traumas a year with a very high penetrating rate of about 28%. Um, and so, you know, during my general surgery residency, it almost seemed natural that I would find a path and take a path in trauma critical care. And, and that's, that's what I ended up doing. Um, I was recruited back as faculty after my fellowship at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And really for the first five years of practice focused on trauma, acute care, but began to de develop a bit of a niche. And, and um, I'll get into that and kind of explain as to how I got to where I am today. I think probably the majority of you on the line, if not all, have some trauma and or acute care background um, and hopefully you know, have some interest in how do we develop robotic surgery um, and, and incorporate that into our practice, which I'll, which I'll get into. Um, I am now down in Southern California at Simi Valley um, Hospital, which is an Adventist health system. And I, I'm directing their robotics program there. So again, my, my practice has changed from academics to private to now um, hospital employed, quasi private. When, you know, when I was recruited back as faculty, as you know, trauma and acute care surgeries, we see the sickest patients. We see the patients that come in at all hours of the, of the night. We have these horrible motor vehicle accidents in the center. It's a shotgun blast injury or even a patient that's had multiple previous surgeries from perforated diverticulitis. But what we end up finding is a lot of these patients end up developing some sort of an incisional hernia, right? It's the nature of what we do as maximally invasive surgeons. And so as a trauma acute care surgeon early in my practice, my interest and niche that I wanted to develop was in abdominal wall reconstruction. It really started during residency, um, but I really started to expand upon that as I um, was more involved with my, with my practice. But as I was doing these cases and I was seeing all patients of all shapes and sizes with respect to previous open abdomen, maybe they had a skin graft or again, just a large midline incisional hernia. 
I was doing these cases open. We were doing really nice open posterior repairs, posterior release with the trans abdominis release or transversus abdominis release. And these patients did well, right? We could, we could cure them of their hernia and we can give them a big, nice, long, <laughs> maximally invasive incision, or as some people like to say, minimally invasive because they only do a single site incision, although it is literally, you know, sternum down in the pubis to develop these, um, to develop these uh, planes and to be able to do these repairs. So as I was seeing these patients and I was learning more about hernia surgery, I really wanted to figure out how I could transition my practice with respect to abdominal wall. And as an acute care surgeon, again, we are trained as maximally invasive surgeons, right? We're dealing with the most complex of trauma injuries, complex general surgery uh, emergencies. Many acute care trauma surgeons don't have elective practices, so they depend upon shift work and what comes in through the emergency department. If you do have an elective practice, maybe you have a focus of abdominal wall reconstruction or bariatrics or et cetera, et cetera. But really an acute care surgeon encompasses all of the components of trauma, general surgery and emergency general surgery. And so some of the obstacles that we face with having an elective practice is that our skill set with respect to complex laparoscopy, uh, laparoscopy and minimally invasive surgery can be limited. So we're often doing gallbladders, of course, laparoscopically, but again, sick patients, middle of the night, maybe appendectomy, maybe you've done some um, perforations or some somewhat more complex operations, but as we spend that year doing our critical care fellowship, that year is predominantly non-operative. So this takes us even further away from that complex MIS skill set. But we are the ones that are managing the bariatric complications that come in the middle of the night or the colorectal complications. So these patients that have had procedures done in an MIS fashion, we are the ones that are potentially on the front lines dealing with them after hours. And we can't always apply minimally invasive techniques. And as trauma is becoming more non-operative, no doubt that emergency general surgery is becoming more minimally invasive. And as a trauma acute care surgeon, I wanted to figure out how can I help to at least apply some MIS practices to these patients. So <clears throat> my practice began to evolve after being out for a few years. My hernia repair techniques is that was my main area of elective uh, practice. And a lot of that came through the trauma you know, clinic um, or through the residence clinic, but we were doing a lot of open inguinal. I had done some lap tep inguinal hernia repairs and then of course laparoscopic ventral. But as many of you know, those are painful procedures. It's very difficult to operate on the anterior abdominal wall. Being able to achieve defect closure is difficult with straight sticks, not to mention all of the tackers that was very painful for patients. And so I just wasn't happy with what I was offering to my patients with, with the laparoscopic techniques. And so even with my open complex ab wall repairs that required a release, I started performing more open um, reef stopa repairs, even for the smaller defects, because I just wasn't happy with what could be done laparoscopically. But as I started going to these meetings with respect to hernia repair, I started hearing about the robot. And I felt that, you know what, this might be something that I could learn and offer to my patients. So in 2016, we got a, her uh, we got a, a Da Vinci robot at our institution that came with urology. And I then dedicated my practice to learning this skill set and really going through a pathway that have allowed me to achieve the skill set to be able to offer advanced complex hernia repair to patients. In order to do that, you have to start simple, right? So as an acute care surgeon, again, not a, a very um, advanced, if you will, or, or complex set of skills for minimally invasive operations across all specialties, it makes sense to start simple, and that's with gallbladders. These, this is probably one of the most common procedures that we perform as acute care surgeons and as general surgeons. So when you started, when we start on the robot, the recommendation, of course, is to start simple. The other one is going to be inguinal hernia repair. One of the things with respect to robotic surgery is that you don't have to do a lot of laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair to learn robotic inguinal hernia repair. In fact, this is one of the biggest areas that's growing with respect to general surgeons who are learning the robotic technology is they're able to apply now minimally invasive techniques for their hernia repairs that were done open for so long. But dedicating my time to this early, um, early set of cases to get through the learning curve was what allowed me then to take it a step further. So my goal, again, 
much like many people that I talk to and many of you that are listening, you may be thinking, well, maybe I want to adopt the robot. Maybe you already have, but I'm not planning to, uh, to apply robotics to every um, aspect of my practice, right? I'm going to keep it for the most complex of cases. I had a similar thought in mind in the beginning with respect to my complex hernia repairs, but in order to get to that level of complexity, you have to go through this learning curve. And I stress to everybody having a really thoughtful progression of case complexity is what's gonna be able to get you to that point. So I started with my ventrals doing an IPOM repair, an intraperitoneal underlay mesh repair. That is what we were essentially replicating from the laparoscopic world, only now we can close the defects, right? We can give, get rid of transfascial suture fixation and we can take it to the next level from the iPod and now move the mesh to the extra peritoneal space. So we went and did pre-peritoneal repairs until we then did the ETEP approach. Well, actually I, I should switch these two slides because ETEP is really an approach and it's definitely, I think at the peak of what we, what we do with respect to, to the different approaches and, and the skill set that it takes. But basically I went through this learning curve of complexity in order to get to the point of TAR. What I realized after now having done a variety of hernia techniques and being able to apply this to my practice was that I think more patients can benefit from this technology, technology than just the hernia patients, right? So yes, I, I was able to go through the learning curve, get to the point that I was comfortable offering a different hernia technique, depending on patient characteristics, previous repairs and whatnot. Um, but as I'm going through and I'm now performing all of these different repairs and seeing the outcomes from my hernia patients, I realize that there are other patients that can benefit from this. So that slide that you saw previously with the open transversus abdominis release, those big incisions, I was finally there. I was able to get to offering this to my patients. This is an example of a, of a patient who had two previous midline surgeries. Um, these were both emergency surgeries that he had had from, um, you know, years prior. And he comes to see me with this large hernia defect. And now I can do a minimally invasive robotic assisted transversus abdominis release and get the patient out actually same day, right? This is a huge jump from our five to six day open repairs. But again, I saw the benefits of this, some, a patient like this and what we can offer. And I, I felt the need to take it to the next step. So as we get through a hernia spectrum, whether it's ventral hernia, inguinal hernia, large scrotal hernias, um, you know, all hernia repairs in my practice now will often get offered an MIS repair. And with robotic surgery, specifically with respect to general surgery, it is the most rapidly growing area of robotics is in general surgery. It continues to grow because there's so many different specialties that are now um, uh, able to to evolve their practices and apply this technology to their to their procedures, whether it's colorectal, whether it's urology, but for general surgery, hernia surgery, cholecystectomy, colorectal, bariatric, all of the different specialties. And I argue that we talk, we're talking a lot more about acute care surgery now, but very shortly after I adopted robotics and got through my learning curve and started to see the benefits from these complex hernia repairs, I realized that it was our acute care surgery patients that would benefit. Sickest patients, all hours of the night, those are the ones that we want to get out of the hospital sooner. If we can avoid a big, large laparotomy incision when it's safe and if the patient can tolerate it, then why wouldn't we try to offer MIS? So with that, I then took on the next progression of case complexity, if you will. And I said, okay, now we're going to start pushing the emergency cases that come through. So started again with gallbladders, only now these are acute coles, right? Again, the most common, one of the most common things that we see taking it then to incarcerated and strangula strangulated hernias with or without the need for bowel resection, small bowel obstructions, ischemic bowel, bowel perforations, and this one on the right, which I'll talk about later, but perforated diverticulitis, taking it through what I think is the learning curve or complexity with respect to acute care surgical cases is then getting us to the point now where we can really apply this, this technology to every patient that comes through the door. So let's start with gallbladder. You know, this is, I think, one of the things we hear so much about when it comes to the adoption of robotics is, well, why do it robotically when I can just do it laparoscopically? We won't get too in-depth unless we have questions afterwards with respect to time, um, but, you know, timing in the operating room is different for every surgeon, and I can tell you now I'm faster than I, was lapars than I am laparoscopically, and I'm actually a pretty skilled laparoscopic surgeon because of the bariatric surgery that I was doing. But Many surgeons now, as you really adopt robotics and you apply it to all your patients, you become 
more proficient, more efficient. Ultimately, you can be faster for some of these disasters. This lady was a lady that had a previous rectal cancer, actually a recently resected rectal cancer and was diverted. And four weeks later comes to me with acute cholecystitis. You could see the ostomy bags, right? Where I may be placing some of my ports for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So I opted to go ahead and I, I decided from the beginning, I'm gonna probably do this robotically place my initial port optically in the left upper quadrant just to take a look around. And this is what you see in the middle was literally all of her small intestine, not just the ileostomy was, was up against the anterior abdominal wall, very much where I would be placing many of my laparoscopic ports. You can imagine trying to manipulate your port placement laparoscopically can very, be very difficult because triangulation is all, you know, laparoscopy is all about triangulating the instruments. But instead, I was able to actually do this lady's gallbladder through these three ports here on her left lateral abdominal wall, did it safely, did it very well, and she was able to be discharged the following day. You know, I, I, I get, again, the question about gallbladders all the time, and I say there's no such thing as an elective coli anymore. It's very rare we see that robin, you know, egg blue gallbladder, especially after COVID, because so many patients were delayed with their surgeries or they were afraid to come into the hospital. These are the cases that we are dealing with as acute care surgeons are on call. And these are the patients that really benefit because opening these, you know, I'll, I'll argue with anyone, you're not gonna have better visualization doing an open gallbladder, regardless of what the gallbladder looks like. Patients with previous cholecystostomy tubes, just acute, you know, edematous cholecystitis. And it's not just the matter of the visualization because as you guys probably know, the robot allows for 10 times uh, magnified view, we have articulated instruments. It's obviously 3D. And these instruments are like an extension of my hands. It's much different than straight laparoscopic instruments where we have no articulation and it's just very difficult to maneuver the instruments. But in addition to all of the ergonomic benefits from the robot, we have the ability to utilize Firefly with every single um, gallbladder. I, 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 I use the in, uh, immunofluorescence imaging for all of these cases. It allows you to evaluate the anatomy before even having to do any dissection. And I'll talk about why I think that's important in a second. But for these cases with a lot of scarring, perhaps a Maritzi syndrome, there's just you know uh, a lot of inflammation, whatever the case may be, these cases with Firefly and having that extra level of, of visualization is I think safe, safe and safer. And I think it allows us to establish the critical view just like we would do and do it in a more, a more comfortable way. I'm not saying that these cases are easier, but it definitely makes them a bit simpler to do. Now talk about gallbladders, right? I think one of the most important things with respect to coles is we want to avoid complications. I mean, if you're a part of SAGES, you know that they have done nothing but, but everything really to focus on the safe cholecystectomy um, pathway. And we're trying to avoid common bile duct injury. And of course, I think we're trying to avoid the morbidity of converting to open. So this was actually a big study out of UIC that looked at near a thousand minimally invasive cholecystectomies. And of all of the robotic cholecystectomies that were done, Firefly was utilized. They looked at what were the risk factors for converting to open. Male gender, acute or gangrenous cholecystitis, and age over 40. Pretty much everybody that comes to us for the most part through the emergency department, right? And they found that for patients overall within this study, there was about a four times, a little over three times increase um, risk of having, um, of converting to open. But I'm going to talk about how we build a program and why understanding cost is so important. And this doesn't even focus on Think of the incisional hernias that are occurring as a result of these large incisions and things like that, but morbidity and mortality for the patient alone. And then we'll take it to um, another study, which was a large national inpatient sample that looked over 225,000 patients, again, looking at risk of conversion. But the purpose was of this, again, was cost, because these are the things that we need to talk to our administration about. I'm finding more and more, it's less the surgeons that are having issues with the concept of adopting robotics for their patients, but it's administration sometimes can be difficult to, to get that message across and how do we talk to them? And I'll talk about all of that. But again, the conversion, the risk of conversion from lap to open procedures for emergent cholecystectomy led to a 259% higher cost with conversion and a higher mortality. Again, something that we're just trying to avoid. And when you think about bile duct injuries, and I thought this was really important, 
This study looked just at bile duct injuries, 800 bile duct injuries, 72% were elective gallbladders, 91% were started laparoscopically, and of the 37% that were converted to open, the majority, it was twice as many were converted, were, were identified as having the bile duct injury after converting. So again, converting to open does not necessarily make for a safer operation if you're having trouble. There are other options that we can do, which we're not going to necessarily get into with respect to subtotal and things like that. But I, you know, all coles are definitely not the same, at least not in my opinion. This lady with multiple previous operations, including a previous um, partial liver resection. This lady had, um, as you can see, a lot of scarring, very difficult, couldn't even elevate the, the gallbladder. And I can see that there's some important structures down here, but still not quite clear as to where the common bile duct and the cystic duct would be. Firefly and the ability to articulate my instrumentation allow me to do a safe operation and do a complete cholecystectomy for this patient. We can watch that in a second and look at what Firefly is going to do and actually really delineate the anatomy. It shows that there's the common duct, but still not quite sure what's going on with the cystic duct, but going in and out of Firefly, literally at the tips of my fingertips, able to click in and out, allowed me to be uh, um, aware of the anatomy throughout the entire procedure. The patient on the right, again, one of the cases that we may see is an acute care surgeon and a patient that had a previous ruin Y gastric bypass came in with cholelithiasis. Well, obviously gastroenterology is not going to be able to do a traditional ERCP transorally. So, um, you know, I took the patient with GI to the operating room, did their cholecystectomy, and then gained access to the gastric remnant with a gastrostomy, placed a 15 millimeter port, as you can see here, and then the gas, uh, gastroenterologist was able to then do their ERCB as though it was a normal ERCP through the remnant into the duodenum and extract that stone. And with that, the patient did well, had a minimally invasive total procedure and was discharged home the next day. Again, this is an acute care surgeon who, if you don't have a lot of complex laparoscopic skills, were able to do this in a minimally invasive fashion for this patient. And if you like IOC, a lot of people think that you can't do intraoperative cholangiogram with the robot, but you actually absolutely can. And it's pretty quick. It really only takes an added couple of minutes. I do this rarely, but I will do it if I think it's necessary. Obviously, with the ability to have the RCP, you don't necessarily need to do as many common bile duct explorations, but I can tell you I'm actually much more comfortable doing common bile duct explorations on the robot than I was doing them laparoscopically. So this is just another, uh, another example of what we can do um, MIS in these complex patients. And then just an added benefit, I think, and I actually just saw this lady in, in, uh, at her post-op visit today, you know, Southern California, we get asked a lot about, can you hide my scars? And it's incredible how many people actually ask that. And this was a lady that um, literally in the, for her consultation said, can you, can, can I show you my tan lines? I, I would like to see if we can hide my scars. And I said, sure. And so I was able to do a three port cholecystectomy for her below her tan lines. Um, this is an example of what a three port looks like. She went home the same day. She did fantastic. No pain medications afterward. And she's extremely happy with the aesthetic appearance. You can do this for acute coles too, but again, not necessarily the cases that we start out with. But point being is you cannot manipulate the, the laparoscopic instrumentation the way that we can the robotic instrumentation. And we can really get our ports placed and we can do things that we wouldn't necessarily think of doing before. Um, but this is just an example of that. Um, but let's take it on to emergency general surgery. I think this is really where the robot is highlighted for us um, as acute care surgeons, whether it's a perforated gastric ulcer, as you see on the left, um, that this is a case that really takes about 20 minutes, 30 minutes um, total when you do this with the robotic instrumentation, other types of perforations, being able to get to every quadrant um, of the abdominal cavity, and just really, you know, in cases for a perforated ulcer where we're going to be doing suturing and we're going to be doing, you know, in this particular case, a modified gram patch, suturing the defect and bringing up a tongue of momentum, being able to do this with wristed instruments just makes it a lot easier if you don't have a lot of um, experience with intracorporeal suturing and things like that. So there's her ulcer. I went ahead and placed some interrupted silk sutures as we normally would, brought up the omentum. Um, was able to secure a tongue of momentum within that, and then, uh, you know, wash her out, leave a drain, start her on a diet pretty much post-operatively, and she was home on post-op day two. 
you know, we'll scope her later and do all those things. But again, avoiding a midline laparotomy incision, which you can see can clearly be dealt with as we know, if, if we know what we're dealing with, can clearly be dealt with minimally invasively and, you know, eliminate the need for a week long stay. Um, a lot of narcotics and everything that goes along with ileus and, and things like that. So these are just some examples of some of the acute care cases that we can do. Emergency hernia cases, whether it's a carcerated inguinal or a strangulated spagellian hernia, this was actually the patient on the left. Luckily it was all omentum, so he did fine. He didn't have to have anything with the need for bowel resection or anything like that. This patient on the right had an incarcerated loop of um, small bowel within this spagellian defect. It was actually a recurrent hernia that he had had, but Firefly, I was able to use more than once throughout the case to assess the viability of the bowel and just determine the need for resection. In this particular patient, I did not have to resect. If I would have had to have resected, I would have done a primary repair, resected the bowel and been done with it, but I was able to do a preperitoneal repair and get this patient home, um, actually discharged the following day, did fine. Um, but you can go on to do your typical preperitoneal repairs in these emergency cases. But to, again, with Firefly, I probably had not had Firefly. I would have probably just done a bowel resection for that case. But I actually utilized it twice throughout the case after I did the dissection and reduction of the hernia contents, which I'll, um, you know, just to fast forward with everything that was actually incarcerated, not just the bowel within that defect that we're able to get reduced. Um, you know, three small incisions, being able to repair this and give a nice large piece of mesh that overlaps so this patient doesn't have a recurrence, um, which is really, I think, important, you know, in these, in these cases, especially the recurrent ones. And this was one, you know, really, I think one of the, one of the probably not most difficult, but I think difficult decision to whether or not we're going to do this case. This was a gentleman who Alcohol, um, chronic alcohol and opioid user came in through the emergency department, clearly peritoneal, hypotensive in the 70s, a little tachycardic. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I, and I knew we knew it was perforated diverticulitis based on the CAT scan imaging, and he had a colovesical fistula. And I said, you know, I really, last thing I want to do for this guy, if I can avoid it, is opening him and having a big midline with his alcohol withdrawal, his opioid withdrawal, everything that we're going to be dealing with. And so, I spoke to my anesthesiologist and I said, listen, I have this guy. If at any time you are, you know, nervous about the case or, or he's turning a hair, I said, we'll absolutely convert. I said, but my plan is to dock the robot and do what I can. And they said, no problem. So, you know, we worked together, we resuscitated him and I was able to wash him out, take down the colovesical fistula. Um, you'll see in a minute, we'll, we'll get to the, uh, part of the, um, the phlegmon here, you can see where we're getting to the area of the perforation, basically mobilized everything, resected the large phlegmon and, and sigmoid uh, diverticular disease and area of perforation. And I gave him a, a divert, an end phlostomy, of course, um, washed him out, drained him and diverted him. But all of this was done MIS and he did much better for it. And in fact, he's, he's several months out from this now. He's not drinking, he's not smoking. And my plan will be at some point to get him reversed, um, which will again be done, you know, robotically. And again, he he was able to get through this. We were able to get him through this in an MIS fashion, which, you know, if you can do, I mean, really everybody benefits from that. And there's the the big hole in perforation. Um, here's another example. And again, older, sicker patients is what we're seeing, right? So this was an 86 year old female. Um, pretty active, actually, 86-year-old female who came in with free air and peritonitis. I use CAT scan often to really guide what I do for these acute care cases. It helps me to determine where I'm going to place my ports. And I knew something was going on in the lower abdomen, but I wasn't quite sure what. And when I got in, this is what I saw. So I actually thought she may have either had a perforated appendicitis or a perforated sequel cancer. I didn't know because all of this momentum was stuck in the right lower quadrant. But as I took it all down... I was able to find the cecum as you see here. And once I started to mobilize the cecum and I found the appendix, you'll see that it's actually normal um, in just a second. Um, basically, there we go, totally normal appendix. I'm like, okay, well, this is not clearly not her issue, but I do see that there's something going on down here. There's some fibrotus exudate in the pelvis. So once I ruled that out, then I went ahead and I began to run the bowel. It didn't take long to find the area of perforation I will tell you, I do run the bowel in these cases and, and I, you can do that uh, robotically and confidently robotically, but she had an isolated um, perforation at the uh, 
right at the like mesenteric border there. Um, unclear as to what the cause of that perforation was, but went ahead and did a small bowel resection and primary anastomosis for this lady. Um, all of this is done intracorporeally, you know, much like what you would do laparoscopically if you were able to do this laparoscopically, but did a small bowel resection, primary anastomosis. The interesting thing about this lady, she did fantastic. She didn't take a single narcotic medication postoperatively, and I was actually going to discharge her on post-op day one, but more to her story was, I'm assuming due to her peritonitis, she actually fell as the day that she was coming into the emergency department as we, you know, a lot of these patients are septic for some reason, they fall, they break a hip. She actually had a knee injury. And so we had to get ortho involved. They did some injections for her knee um, images and um, uh, uh, physical therapy. And so she actually ended up going home on post-operative day three, but she did very well from her perforation and, and minimally invasive uh, hernia repair, or <laughs> hernia repair, sorry, minimally invasive small bowel resection and anastomosis of hernia on the mind. Um, so, you know, when talking about incorporating robotics into your practice, one of the things that we hear a lot is takes too many people, takes too much staff, takes too much time, right? How do I change culture? All of these things. The beauty of the robotic platform is that you don't need an extra assist. You don't need an extra nurse in the room. Honestly, it often eliminates the need for an assistant. I don't have an assist in my room. I don't use an assist for any case. This is literally my team, the anesthesiologist, myself, my nurse, and my tech, and that's really all that you need. The only time I have more than one nurse or tech in the room is when we're training another staff you know, member because everybody that comes through gets trained because everybody is, you know, we, we as an acute care surgeon, 24 seven access is what we, what I expect. So how do we do that 24 seven expanded access? Well, I can tell you, this is a major hot topic all over the U S because I literally get asked probably weekly for some sort of either webinar zoom or go to a state to talk to both administrators and surgeons about adopting robotics for the acute care surgeon. It really is beginning to grow all over the country. And I think there's probably even more states that I could have added in here. But the question is, how do we do this? And I'll, I'll tell you, if you're already in a program that has a robot, okay, and they're already doing elective robotic surgery, whether it be urology, colorectal, GYN, and even general surgery, as an acute care surgeon, you have to be involved and you have to have a voice within the steering committee. You really need to be an advocate for both yourself as a surgeon, right? We want to be able to do surgery longer. We want to have better outcomes for our patients, but then also advocate for your patients with giving them that minimally invasive option. So a steering committee, what that means or what that entails, if you're not sure, is that obviously there's the committee chair, surgeons that are doing robotic surgery, and then definitely members of the administrative team. I can tell you that there's at least three members of the C-suite that are present within our steering committee meetings every now every quarter they, we started, they were monthly. We have OR management, the lead robotic tech, whoever's the program manager. These are all the people that are going to be there. And the purpose of these meetings is to say, you know, who, who can we be utilizing? Who can be utilizing the robot? How do we establish block times? How do we establish privileging guidelines? You go as an acute care surgeon and say, listen, our acute care group wants to be able to offer this to our patients. What do we need to do? Let's educate the staff. The biggest, of course, pushback, which I'll talk about, is going to be changing the culture of utilizing the robot after hours. I argue with everybody, the robot is an instrument. It's an evolution of minimally invasive technology. We don't get told we can't use a special um, you know, stapler after hours, so it really should be no different. But this is an important area where we can really utilize this time to educate everybody and communicate what the importance is of robotics. How do you do that with respect to molding a culture? You have to establish and have an alignment with not only your administrative team, but with your entire care team. I really get a lot in the beginning, you get them excited about it. You, I spent the time. You really have to be sort of a, a, a surgeon leader or champion, as we like to call it, with, with spending the time to get everybody trained. And what is, it's not just, you know, the, the nurses, the techs, I mean, we even are talking SPD and all of these things, we'll talk about that, but the other piece is not just with education and training, but with data. So the way to start, first, if, if you have data in your program, you can look, I actually just spoke with a, a surgeon that came for an observation yesterday, she's an acute care surgeon, and she says, you know, 
We actually just, we've converted, she said, three gallbladders to open it over the last two weeks. That's a very high conversion rate nowadays, truthfully. And so you have to be able to share that data and have your administrative, administrative team look at that data. And I tell them, I said, look at our open conversion rate. Look at the common bile duct injury rate. Look at my data. And I collect all my data. And I'll talk about how I do that as well. But we collect every piece of data so we can look at cost overall, times overall, outcomes overall. And that's the kind of stuff that your C-suite team wants to hear about because that is how they start to realize, you know what, we can use not only utilize the robot as a marketing piece, which they can do, but we want to utilize that robot to give us better outcomes, right? Better outcomes for our patients overall. And let's look at that data too. Now that we can standardize procedures and reduce variability across procedures and surgeons. So as far as the training team, one of the resources that Intuitive has, and I tell you guys, you know, anybody that's trying to incorporate robotics, you got to realize that Intuitive has done a very good job of this. They've been around for decades now. They have so many resources that are available to every hospital system to help them to incorporate robotics into their practices, especially if they already have a robot in place. But they have the Genesis team. The Genesis team really is a specialized team that helps to standardize processes within the operating room and to and maximize efficiency. So this is literally a picture of my back table. Um, we had the Genesis team come. I sat down with my tech and I said, listen, I don't want anything open other than what I use for each procedure because this is gonna minimize the time it turns, takes to turn over the room, what needs to go down for, for sterilization with an SPD and to get us moving faster. We collect all of our data with respect to turnover times. We take it to the robotic steering committee and each month we have benchmarks we wanna hit. Our fastest month for turnover average was 13 minutes. It was actually too fast. And I told them, look, I want us to get to 20 minutes and we're good with that because we need time to really turn over the room. I need to be dictating. We have talked to family and all of these things, but they were so excited about hitting those benchmarks based on what the resources they had gotten and the help that they had gotten from these other teams. They were trying to like, I think, even prove more how efficient they, that they could be. Um, but you know, this is something that's available from Intuitive. It's just things like this to really maximize efficiency. And additional stuff that Intuitive has is the care team training. They do on-site training. I mentioned to you, every nurse and tech that comes through, whether they're a traveler or they're being hired, go through a training process. They do the online modules. They do dry lab training. This is us in the operating room actually showing how to do it. And then we also send them down to a lab if necessary. Intuitive does have labs for the support staff to learn. Um, you know, and again, getting everybody just excited about how we can do better for our patients. Um, I talked about data. Um, I collect all of my own data. I've been doing it since case number one in near a thousand cases now. Um, we have, there are apps available from Intuitive, the My Intuitive app and the My Case Data app. If you haven't heard about them, you can absolutely talk to your, your local rep about getting those, but those actually help you if you're not good at collecting your own data to bring that data together. And then they have a team that actually analyzes that data. And then I can take this to my administrative team and say, hey, look, this is my, in this particular case, cholecystectomy data. This is compared to published data for laparoscopic. I have no conversions compared to a 7% conversion rate in the published data, no 30-day reoperations compared to, you know, one, whatever, and 30-day readmissions with an overall estimated cost avoidance for, per procedure if I do this on the robot versus laparoscopically. You can do this for any type of um, procedure that you do. Again, this is with respect to inguinal hernias. Comparing open to robotic to laparoscopic across the board. Me personally, as I become more proficient, I become more efficient, I become faster and ultimately cheaper. And the outcomes show and our hospital you know, team sees that. So I think it's extremely important to have an understanding of 24 seven access and how do we do that? Um, the way you do it, I hope that I showed is to really um, embrace this total practice con concept. Um, all aspects of surgery. This was a fun one in the top upper left guy came in and of course swallowed a foreign body, you know, didn't have to do an X-lap to get that out of his pylorus. We have ischemic bowel, um, incarcerated hernias and really nasty gallbladders as, as we all see. But embracing that total practice and then expanded 24 seven access is what's allowed us to be able to offer this technology to our patients and we're seeing the outcomes. So to conclude, I think 
as a surgeon, our goal is to commit to a pathway to get proficient with the robotic technology. There are so many different resources available from Intuitive, from those of us that proctor, from your colleagues. I'm sure you probably have um, other surgeons within your hospital systems as well. Track your data so that you can use that if you're wanting to um, start a acute care robotic surgery program. That is going to help you to gain that departmental administrative support so that you can experience the satisfaction of improving patient outcomes at all hours, because I'm a true believer that every single patient deserves the best MIS approach, no matter what time of day they come into the hospital. And that means Saturday in the middle of the night or 7 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for, for your time. I want to thank um, East again and the production team for this, putting this together. This was the first one, so I apologize if I was uh, got my snafu of my computer going down and of course intuitive for their support and if any of you are interested this is my my info I'm always reachable um, and then of course the webinar series is posted on the on the website and I look forward to the Q&A. Um, Dr. Pakula you've left me speechless as usual uh, I'm still trying to get out of that cases that you had shown anyways uh, getting to the nitty-gritties thank you very much uh, everybody on the webinar to put some questions through. Uh, I'll start off with a very basic question, first of all, which was uh, asked by Dr. Haley Yankanich. And uh, the question to you, Dr. Pakula, is that, uh, I know this is difficult to answer, let me tell everybody that, but how many cases do you think to meet your complexity level of cases is the question that has been asked. As you showed that big uh, green arrow going from simple, easier to the harder ones, uh, do you have a number in mind or do you think you get somebody in or how do you decide the complexity to increase the complexity of the cases, Andrew? Yeah. Um, no, it's a great question. Um, I'll tell you what I did and often what I recommend to, to people. So I did, I started with inguinals, coles, and small umbilical hernias. I did my first 20 to 25 cases and then I brought another, I brought a call a friend of mine out to then proctor me again to really refine my technique with respect to, let's say, inguinal hernia, okay? Um, because those first 20 to 25 cases, you're just trying to get the muscle memory down of the robotic instrumentation. You're just trying to not have to think about which foot pedal do I push or which what hand you know motion do I do. So the first 20 or 25 cases is really just to get that muscle memory down. When I got to 60, around 60, I did my first bariatric case. And I didn't talk about bariatrics in this talk, but I do bariatric surgery. So I was still doing all my bariatric cases laparoscopically while I was going through my learning curve. Did my first bariatric case at about 60. I did my first TAR or uh, big abdominal reconstruction at around 75. Um, and I brought a proctor in for that as well. So I'm a big proponent of bringing in help when you're adding a new technique, because again, you might be proficient with the robot by then, but this is still different. It's a different view from the inside than what we're seeing open. Um, it was about, I don't know, maybe 10 cases or 15 cases later, I did my first ETEP. So by a hundred cases, I would say, I had done the spectrum for the most part of definitely of hernia repair. Um, everybody's different, but I, I think that by 40 or 50 cases is when you are really getting, getting fast and getting good and comfortable with starting to push the envelope. I really did progress even with my acute care cases the way that I showed it. I did appies, I did gallbladders, I did smaller incarcerated hernias. And then now, I mean, I really, there's not much I won't doctor robot for and I can get through. Um, but I just think probably 40 or 50 is a good number to say you're really proficient to start taking it to the next level. Thank you for that. I hope uh, Dr. Yankanich is happy with that answer. Uh, moving on to the next thing, it's it's a very common thing. Most of us start doing appendicectomies, and uh, Dr. Lee has asked this question as to how early in your acute care practice did you adopt the lap uh, the robotic appendicectomy, and what do you think is the value over laparoscopic appendicectomy, Dr. Pula? Right. So it's interesting. I'll answer that in a couple ways. So first of all, I, I adopted it pretty early because it was one of those early acute care cases that I knew. I, you know, was like gallbladder is very common. So it was going to be easy to do. And I say this and I, we have the data and I have it here on my phone, on my, my, my case data app uh, or my intuitive app. My average appendectomy time is nine minutes right now. My first one on the console was four minutes. That sounds crazy if you think about it, 
but the ability to see, get right to it, and just do what I need to do with the instrumentation makes these cases faster. So that's all comers. That's from nasty perforated appendicitis to just a little, you know, hyperemic appendicitis. But the value for me and the robot is twofold. One, you never know what you're going to get when you get in there, just like a gallbladder. And if it is, if it is the most difficult stuff, has a big phlegmon, maybe has an abscess, whatever it has that you didn't necessarily appreciate on CT and now you're in the abdomen, having the ability to use those instruments makes it a lot easier than laparoscopic. And it just gives me the ability, <clears throat> excuse me, to utilize that technology and just do a safe operation and patients do well. The other thing is I can manipulate port placement again. So I don't place ports along the left side like people traditionally think you would for an appy. Mine are actually all super pubic, even though it's the robotic technology and I can still do that procedure and hide their incisions. So appies are still less than 20 minutes skin to skin on the robot. Just like many people will say, I can do a 15 or 20 minute laparoscopic appendectomy. Absolutely, so can I. But you know, if I have this tool and then you think of it and utilize it as an instrument, then, then you know, that's what has allowed me to get to the perforations and bowel resections and whatnot. Just continuing on that, are you uh, thinking of uh, doing anything to reduce the cost of the robotic appendicectomies? I saw that in your presentation with your laparoscopic cholecystectomies. This is a question by Dr. Morrison uh, as to how do you do your robot APs to keep your costs down? Okay, so a couple of things. Um, instrumentation, so minimizing the use of instruments. So I'll tell you, I use a stapler to divide the appendix. It's funny we're talking about the, we're about, uh, we always get a lot of questions about appendicitis. I, I will just say that um, it, <laughs> it's the one case that intuitive does not, has not yet released to be done on the robot. Although I'm hoping with, with the stapler that's just being launched that we'll be able to talk about it more freely. But I've done the ligate, tie the base, dunk it technique just to use suture and minimize the staple load. I've also done the staple load. My go-to technique is I use a bipolar to take the meso appendix, a stapler, and that's it. That is cheaper for a number of reasons. This one single staple fire is actually not that expensive. Number one, you can also use clips if you want, but I use a staple fire. The other piece to that is I'm out of the OR faster. So you gotta think of overall cost. You gotta think of anesthesia time and operative time. It takes me longer to place a couple of sutures, ligate and tie than it does a single staple fire. So when I went to my hospital and I asked them, I had my administration, I said, I want you guys to look at my numbers and see my costs. Tell me if I'm too expensive for my appendectomies. They said, you are cheaper than anybody else in the hospital with how you're doing them because of speed and minim minimizing the instrumentation, like speed of getting out of the OR faster. So I think the key is to think about minimizing instruments. When you're first starting, don't worry about that because your goal is just to get good with the robot. But then you can start to think about now I do three, four coles instead of four. I've eliminated the need for a scissor and a hook because I use the scissors. I don't need that fourth port or instrument because I just use a suture. So there's a lot of different ways that you can think about that um, and efficiencies you can build upon to make it cheaper. Thank you so much once again, Dr. Pakula. In the interest of time, I'm going to concentrate on a few cultural questions, which is the biggest problem as for us uh, in terms of setting up the program. So a uh, few questions which I'm going to combine, especially from Dr. Grant, Dr. Ginwala, and uh, uh, Dr. Bussing. To start off with, uh, Dr. Grant says that at the previous hospital, he used to have a robotic team. And the current hospital, we do not have a team and 24 seven access. Uh, is eliminating the robotic team a question, uh, is an answer to the question? Uh, same thing from Dr. Ginwala, who says that the problem is that 80% of the time, the robotics have been used by the elective surgeons and the uh, learning curve is mostly in the emergency setting and it's difficult at her institution because she's got a single surgeon attempting the emergency generally surgeon call as well as the ICU call as the in-house trauma surgeon. And uh, finally, coming to the question of credentialing and the internal politics, Dr. Rodriguez has asked that, how do you convince somebody, especially if the chief person doesn't believe in robotics? And uh, uh, basically, how do you get around the politics of starting a robotic program on the acute care surgery? And uh, everybody wants to take this process up, but what are the tips or pathways for credentialing? Sorry, Dr. Pakula, I just kind of. 
That's okay. Pushed all those questions together. Just as Christina yeah. said that uh, she's going to be out of time soon. So I thought we'll pick up a few things about cultural incompetencies in setting up the program. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll answer that and just say any questions that get run out of time for you guys can always reach out to me separately. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is a cultural change. I've been in a couple of different programs, one which had a robot, they were only during the day and I wanted to incorporate acute care surgery. The other where I am now where we started it from the ground up from the beginning was going to be 24 seven. The key is talking with the administration is all about data, as I said, and I mean that and it's showing outcomes and you can show it from other people. I, you have to get the team involved. I literally spent a weekend, more than one weekend with the rep from Intuitive going over every aspect of the robotic system. So the patient car, the video tower, and the, the uh, console, getting them comfortable with that, getting their hands on it. And I said, listen, patients are gonna benefit from this, giving a lot of talks, even as simple as ICG, showing them that these patients are no different than the patients that come in electively, and this is just a tool. And, if, and ask them, you know, if this was your mother, how would you, would you want them to have a big open incision or would you want me to be able to do this minimally invasive because they've come in in a, in a whatever time of night? With respect to block time and, and elective surgeons, there's a couple of things. There are hospitals now that are actually dedicating, and this is happening over the country. So it's just a matter of getting out there with, with conversations with other hospitals. Hospitals that are dedicating a room with the robot, for robotic time for the acute care service. So maybe it's seven to noon or what have you. Um, that's one aspect. So if they, if you're learning, if they're trying to incorporate after hours, they're at least letting them have and get on the robot during the day for patients that come in in the middle of the night. There's, I don't have a quote robotic team. I expect, and this comes with conversations with administration and OR leadership, every single nurse and tech should be trained. It's fine if you have a team during the day, but that changes at night. So yes, I have my usual team that's with me on my elective operating days, but when I'm on call, whoever's on call is gonna be in my OR. So I stress to them the importance of every single member of that team, nurse and tech being trained. So everybody has gone through that training and, um, and it, it just takes time. It, it takes a lot to break down that culture, so to speak, but it's, you know, it is, um, it is doable. It just it just takes time, and you got to have multiple conversations. Um, I know that's a lot. I don't know if I answered all of those questions, but I don't think there needs to be a robotic team. Everybody should be trained. Uh, thank you so much. It, it was a difficult constellation of questions, wasn't it? But I thought uh, again that it's going to be a big thing because every one of us wants to do this, but there are various. Uh, kind of hurdles which we are facing and to come from you that we can still do it is really great. Uh, Dr. Badami has asked a phenomenal question which uh, both Dr. Skinner and I feel uh, would should really be answered in terms of as a he's a graduating trauma and an acute care surgeon and uh, how does he navigate finding a job uh, which helps him incorporate an acute care robotic surgery in his program uh, because trauma surgeons do trauma centers allow installation of robotic care practices and especially with the elective surgeons how comfortable they feel when a trauma surgeon in a hemodynamically stable patient starts firing up the robot so it was a long <laughs> so what exactly so as a graduating as a graduating finishing your practice how do you look for a job that offers it um yes. Yes. i mean i think Number one, you know, the majority of hospital systems know that surgeons are finishing their training with the expectation that they are going to get some robotics in their training. And if not that, then with the expectation that they can do robotic surgery in their practice. If you've done robotics in your residency or fellowship and you have even the certificate, you take that to your job where you're, you know, you're applying for that job. You really would be surprised at how many hospitals do offer acute care surgeons a robot or after hours. It's not complete commonplace, but there are a lot of big, even bigger uh, institutions um, that are starting to push it. The nice thing you got, you know, I get called from elective surgeons at times to help them because we are trauma surgeons, right? We deal with pretty significant injuries or, or disease processes. If we have the skill set to do that minimally invasive, they actually like it when we're there to help them. 
So I think you just have to talk to the other surgeons that are at the hospital that you're, you're looking to join, talk to the administration and say, you know, what is your feeling on adopt, allowing the acute care team to utilize this technology like everybody else? Because, you know, we get a lot of pushback from administrators, but in the next several years, this isn't going to be a conversation, you know, um, because everyone's going to be, it's going to be pretty commonplace. It's just going to take us some time to get there. I don't know if that answers. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think that was well said, uh, Dr. Pakula, because it's, it, you get something credential that would be really great. Last but not the least, I just want to ask you this question, which most of them have come up. They have been impressed by what you've done. How do they get in touch with you, Dr. Pakula? <laughs> um, probably the easiest thing is to go to my website. Um, you can get through to me through Facebook or Instagram through there, but it's uh, drandreapakula.com. Pretty simple. Um, you can really probably access. It was on that last page. Not sure if you were able to get any of those QR codes, but drandreapakula.com is my website. It's the easiest way. Um, and I'm, I really, you know, I'm happy to talk to anybody that's interested to, to learn more. Great. We want to thank everyone for attending. Um, um, unfortunately, we were not able to get to all the questions, but please reach out to Dr. Pakula and she will, you know, answer your questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Pakula, for such a wonderful talk. Um, this was a great start to the seminar. Thank you, Dr. Patel, and for everyone, Christine, the panelists, um, and the producers for putting this on. Thank you, and hopefully we'll see you at the next one. Thank you, too, for, for moderating. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much.